So we're going to go ahead and we're going to jump into another story about God doing incredibly impossible things. Uh, we are on part two of our series on Exodus. Um, we're looking at five different consecutive stories from the book of Exodus. Now, last week, Daniel was here with you, and he did an amazing job talking about the Passover, the story of Passover in Exodus that is kind of the story of the Hebrew people uh, being set free from slavery. Um, and I'm super excited about talking through these stories, about telling the stories of the formation of the Hebrew people becoming the nation of Israel. Because these formation stories for them also have the power and the effectiveness to form and shape us. Now these stories, oftentimes stories in general, remind us that of what the overarching story that we find ourselves in and what our role is. And this is so important because oftentimes, as, as we've talked about before, we get really confused about the story that we are in. We think the story that we're in is about like accumulating wealth and we think the story that we're in is about impressing people with our worth, work ethic and our skills and our accolades and how perfect we are. We think that the story is about uh, control and getting power, but, but but that's not what this whole story that we're in is about at all. That's not what this story is about. And if we miss what this story is about, we, we, everything changes for us. Now, uh, I've used this example before, but I think it's really good, so I want to use it again. Um, to illustrate how the story we think we're in changes what we do and what we think about ourselves, I want to use the example of a toaster. Right? A toaster has a beautiful role in a beautiful story. The role in the story of the toaster is to take two pieces of toast or pancakes or waffles into itself and warm them to a beautiful brown crisp and then pop them out for hungry bellies to consume. This is a beautiful story, especially when you slather it with some butter and some cinnamon sugar. Like It is good. Love the toaster. But what if the toaster thought that his role was actually something very different, that his role wasn't to crisp goodness and shoot it out, but instead, what if the, role, if the toaster started thinking that his role was actually to wash and sanitize dishes? He thought that he was a character in a story about cleaning dishes. And then all of a sudden, the toaster would wake up one day and start cleaning and washing and drying dishes. Now, from day one, that toaster will find out that it is not very good at cleaning and drying dishes. In fact, every time it tries, it just electrocutes itself. And so day after day, it wakes up and it's like, I'm going to try harder to do better. I'm going to make this happen. So it keeps trying to wash the dishes, but it keeps failing miserably. And after a while, that toaster starts to think, I am terrible at life. I am a terrible toaster. Well, you and me both know that there's nothing wrong with the toaster. The toaster thinks it's, it's, the toaster is playing a role and it's misunderstood the story. This happens to you and me all the time. We, we think that life is falling apart, but really we've misunderstood the story. And what needs to happen, just like that toaster, is we need to be restoried. We need to be reminded of the story that we find ourselves in. And that's what I love about scripture. Scripture has the power to restore us. It reminds us of the real story that began in creation, that continues with you and me, and stretches on until the kingdom of God is fully present on earth. Scripture reminds us of the role that God plays and the role that we are invited into. And so these five stories that we're looking at over the month of July are stories that can help remind us where we've come from. They, they help us understand where we are right now and where we are going, but also the role that we are supposed to be playing in these stories. Now, last week, Daniel shared the story of the Passover, and he started the story that starts with a cry of oppression. It's a group of people who were in bondage. They were held captive. They were slaves for 400 years until God raised up Moses and told him to go to Pharaoh and say, let my people go. And Pharaoh says, nada. I, yeah, Calvin got no, but I went with nada. Yeah, that's right. No. He says no. And so God, through Moses, has plagues come to the country. 
the blood, the frogs, the locusts, the boils, the darkness, the flies, the livestock dot until the final plague where the firstborn child of everyone from Pharaoh all the way down to the slave girl is killed in one night. Except for the Hebrews who trusted in God's divine mercy and protection, who were told to put the blood of a Passover lamb on their doorframe, and those who did, that was a sign that they trusted that God would pass over them, that God would protect them from the destroyer. And so the Hebrews were saved. And Moses, in his fury and grief of his son dying, tell Moses, get your people out of here, you. Get out of here. And so they rise up in the middle of the night. They pack their things as fast as they can, and they run out of the city as fast as they can. They run out of their captivity. And so this story that began with a cry of oppression ends with like this song of freedom that God had liberated them. They were now free people ready to live this free life. They were out of there. But a rabbi once said, that it took four days for the Hebrews to leave Egypt, but it took 40 years for Egypt to leave the Hebrews. See, living out the freedom that God instantaneously gives us in Christ actually takes a lot of time. There's like this process that has to happen in our lives. Immediately, we are free from shame and guilt and addiction and the, uh, the, the, the need to prove our value and our worth, and we're free from past decisions, and we're free from other circumstances that we had no control over. But even though we are now free, a lot of times we're totally clueless about how to walk forward in that freedom. We so often get tangled and ensnared by these old ways. We go back to these old habits. So God may have performed a miracle in freeing us, but we're not sure how to live in the freedom miracle. And so oftentimes our freed life looks very similar to our life that we lived in captivity. Learning to walk in freedom, learning to live out this life of freedom is a process of learning to trust God in this new life. It's a process. And so in our story today, we're going to look at how the Hebrew people had to learn how to walk in this new freedom. And we're going to find that this story is an invitation into this life of freedom that comes through trusting God. Trusting that he will provide a way when there seems like there's no way. And trusting God that allows us to be brave enough to walk forward no matter how fearful we may be. And so let me tell you the story. After Pharaoh had let the people go, he received a report that they had really left. That the Hebrew people had actually left his kingdom. And in embarrassment and in pride and in fear... He got furious, and he had this anguish and this embarrassment rise up inside of him, and he yelled, stop them. What have we done? Don't let them leave. We need to get them back. And so Pharaoh orders his army to assemble. We're told that there were 600 chariots that were assembled. They all jumped on their horses and jumped on their chariots, and they rode off into the wilderness to where the Hebrews were walking. He thought that the Hebrews would be an easy target. You see, they were trapped. The Red Sea was in front of them. Around them was the wilderness. And behind them was Pharaoh's army, ready to just plow them down. Actually, we don't even know what their intention was. What, was it to kill them? Was it to push them into the sea? What, was it to capture them and take them as slaves back? We don't actually know, but, but there was fear in the hearts of the Hebrews as they began to hear the rumbling of the chariots come from behind them. Those at the back of the pack started to push forward, which had the people in front of them notice something's going on back there. And soon everyone was running towards Moses, yelling at him in terror and fear, Moses, Moses, what have you done? Why did you take us out here to die? Why did you do this? We were happy back with the Egyptians. We were happy in our content in our in our enslavement we were happy when they were our captors why did you bring us here just so we would die why didn't you just leave us alone we told you this would happen now obviously that wasn't true they weren't happy as slaves 
But fear does crazy things. And the Hebrew people, this wasn't the first time that when they get afraid, when the first sign of danger comes, they freak out and immediately think that there is no way out, that there is no rescuer. Even though God had just rescued them through Passover, even though God had just done this miraculous thing, they are now freaking out. You see, this time there's an army. You see, this time there's the wilderness. This time there's the sea. We don't know how this story ends. We don't know how God is going to do this, and this one seems impossible. They didn't understand. They didn't understand God's role in this story. They didn't understand how big and how powerful he was. They didn't trust him to deliver them to complete and total freedom. They thought, yeah, he did that, but I don't know that he can do this. And so they began to tell lies about how happy they were before. They began to imagine, well, it wouldn't be so bad to go to captivity. We should have just stayed where we were. We should have just kept living that way. It's so easy and it's so tempting for us to go back to what once ensnared us. It's so easy and it's so tempting to go back to the things that used to hold us captive. See, living free can be incredibly scary. Especially when that which once enslaved you is now hunting you down, is now chasing after you. And you're not sure that you can outrun it, and you're not sure that you can fight it. And so, in this crowd, this mounting mutiny continued to build as they ran after Moses, but Moses didn't buy it. Instead, he speaks to the people in order to calm them, and he says this. He says, do not be afraid. Stand firm, and you will see the deliverance the Lord will bring you today. The Egyptians you see today, you will never see again. The Lord will fight for you. You need only be still. The Lord will fight for you. For you. You need only be still. Now, Moses doesn't tell them, don't be afraid because this really isn't that scary. <laughs> Moses tells them, don't be afraid, but that is really scary. The army that is coming after us is terrifying. He acknowledges their fears are real. But he says, you only need to be still because God will fight for you. Now, I know that we're sitting in a safe place right now. And there's no army attacking us. And so what I wanted to do is I wanted to get your heart pumping just a little bit. So for a second, what they might have been feeling or experiencing. And so I love this movie clip. It's from a movie called Braveheart. I think it came down in like 97, so it's ancient at this point. Um, but it's a story about uh, these scrappy people who want to fight uh, uh, for their freedom. And they have no weapons and they have no training and they're standing up against the king's army with horses and, 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 uh, and, and weapons and the thing that you wear that protects you, armor. And so they, they have nothing and so their odds are very slim of winning this fight. And in this particular battle, they know that the cavalry is gonna come and the cavalry is going to run them over. And in fact, they even discuss the fact that the last time the cavalry came, everybody just fleed. Like everyone just ran to save themselves. Um, and Or if you're brave enough to stand there, then the horses are just gonna trample you and then they've won. So like, how, what are we gonna do? So they get these spears that are like twice as long as a man is what they say and they're like holding these spears at the front line and they say we've got to wait until the horses come to the very front row and then we pick up the spears okay so nobody dies in this clip okay all right so this is what it might have felt like for the hebrew people let's go
nobody dies. <laughs> So that feeling maybe that you got in the pit of your stomach, that rising heartbeat, like that's like this much of maybe what they were experiencing in that moment. And, and Moses tells them, be still. I mean, here, William Wallace, the character played by Mel Gibson, is like, hold, hold, like don't move because if you pick up the sticks too soon, the horses will stop. And if you pick them up too late, you're dead. So he keeps telling them, hold, right? And this is what Moses is telling the Hebrew people he's telling them be still be still God's gonna fight for us be still but the panic that they were experiencing in that moment was terrifying the the fear this was not an easy thing that Moses was telling them to do be still and let the Lord fight for you oh guys in our culture we we don't want anyone to fight for us. We are taught from an early age to fight our own battles. This is a part of American culture, right? You are raised to fight your own battles. Don't let anybody else help you. You defend yourself, right? I remember when I was in seventh grade, I was not a popular seventh grader. Um, I got made fun of a lot and maybe I deserved it. I don't know. Um, but I remember this one experience where I was walking from lunch to my math class with uh, one of the very few friends that I had, and uh, her name was Emily Dudley. And we were walking together, and she started telling me how these kids were brutally making fun of me at lunch, and I wasn't aware of it, and that they were just mocking me and doing all these things. And I was like, I was like, ugh you know, just trying to brush it off or whatever. And she was like, but don't worry. I told them to stop. I stood up for you. I fought for you. And I remember turning to her and being like, I don't need anybody to fight for me. And like, I walked off, right? This is the one friend who stands up for me. And I'm like, back off. Don't fight for me. Like, don't defend me, right? But, but that was this prideful thing inside of me that was like, no, I fight my own battles. I don't let anybody else fight for me other than me. We don't like to put down the gloves and let somebody else do the fighting. And yet that's not the God that we serve. The God that we serve says, let me fight for you. Stop giving into cap captivity. Stop giving into fear. Stop trying to do this on your own. I am there. God says, be still and let me fight. But so often we say, no, I'll do it on my own. I'll fight on my own. We don't let him fight. Now, I want to give you an example of what this is like. Let's say for a second that we were in a uh, worldwide wrestling federation uh, sort of thing, right? Anybody watch WWE or WWF? Anyone? Okay, we got two. Great. You guys are going to, you two are going to love this, okay? So let's imagine for a second that we are in there and all of a sudden it's kind of like the kiss cam. I get selected because of my amazing physical uh, abilities and my stature to fight in the ring, right? So I get chosen and they say, Beth Wolf, come on down and I get in the ring. And they announced that I am going to be fighting Stone Cold Steve Austin, right? Uh, that's my match right there. And I'm like, yeah, I got this. I got this. I'm ready. But they add a little twist. They say, but you get to partner with Dwayne The Rock Johnson. And so here's my partner. And at any time, I can just tap out and say, all right, Dwayne, you got it, right? But so often what we do is we're like, no, I got this. I can take on Stone Cold Steve Austin. I am going to do this thing. But really the right thing for me to do in that situation is to tap out immediately and say, all right, Dwayne, you got this. Like you go in and you fight this battle, but we don't do that. And that's the same thing we do with God. When we're facing people or things that are trying to ensnare us and hold us captive and take away our freedom, we say, no, I'm going to work harder, try harder to do better. I'm going to fix my schedule and then I'm going to make this happen. I'm going to just hunker down and resist this temptation. No. No, God is like your buddy, and he's like, just tap out. Let me fight for you. I've got this thing. And we're like, no, 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 I got this. No, tap out. Be still and let God fight for you. So often we struggle to do that because we struggle to trust we think that we might be able to fight this fight better. We, we think that God might not do it right, that God might not uh, have the outcomes that we want him to have. 
And so we say, no, 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 I will make this happen. Or maybe we're scared of freedom. Maybe we're scared of truly being free, of, of what it would really be like to no longer be chained up to whatever it is that ensnares us. And so we kick God out and we're unwilling to trust him in his ability to fight for us. But freedom, freedom in all of its fullness is never brought by our own efforts. Freedom is only brought by trusting God to make a way when there seems like there is no way. By trusting God and following him in the places that he leads us. Now, being still is not like, okay, whatever, I'll just sit back. Being still is scary. Being still takes guts. Being still requires all of the bravery and the trust that we could possibly muster. You see, going back to the story of the Hebrew people, they're all freaking out, and all of a sudden Moses, told by God, he raises his staff towards the sea, and he stretches out his hands. Now, the people are looking at Moses like, what are you doing? <laughs> this doesn't look like God is fighting for us. Nothing is happening. What are we doing? But he just keeps telling them, be still, be still, let God fight for you. Be still, let God fight for you. And the fight doesn't happen instantaneously. The fight they can't even see it. They can't even, they don't even realize that it's happening. All of they notice is that darkness is present and there's a wind that's blowing through the area. And seconds turn into minutes and minutes turn into hours and they still think nothing is happening until somebody notices that before them in the sea, the wind is driving back the sea. And, and not the whole way, but, but just this path that, that it's drying out the ground and that the water is standing up on the right and the left of them. And there is a pathway forward. And I imagine, I wonder how long it took for somebody in the crowd, somebody in the Hebrew people to realize, I think we're supposed to walk. I think we're supposed to go that way. Could you imagine the mushroom eater, the dangerous, risky person who was willing to start walking on that path with the wall of water to their right and to their left. Come on, guys. I think we're supposed to go. Come on. And they begin to walk forward. That is being still and letting God fight for you. That is not a sit back and do nothing. That is a walk forward bravely and trusting that this is the path that God has laid out for you, for your freedom, for your salvation, and for your connection with him. And so they begin to walk through. First, the really early adapters, the, the ones who are willing to take on the risk, and, and then the late adapters, and then the laggards at the very back being like, oh my gosh, what are we doing? But slowly, all of the people get across the sea. And once Moses is on the other side, God commands him to stretch out his arms and his staff again. And Pharaoh and his army begin to pursue the Hebrew people into the waters, into this dry ground path. But their wheels get stuck, and all of a sudden, there's some confusion that happens, and they don't know what's happening, and they don't go. What's... And what Scripture tells us is it tells us that Pharaoh's army started yelling, the Lord is fighting for them. The Lord is fighting for them. Turn back. Turn back. The Lord is fighting for them. And, but before they could turn back, Moses like stretches out his arms and the waters fall back on them. And they're gone. The thing that had pursued them for so long, the thing that had kept them captive, the thing that had kept them from living in freedom, was gone, and all they needed to do was be still and let God fight for them. It says, at the end of the story, it says, that day, the Lord saved Israel from the hands of the Egyptians, and Israel saw the Egyptians lying dead on the shore. And when the Israelites saw the mighty hand of the Lord displayed against the Egyptians, the people feared the Lord and put their trust in him and in Moses, his servant. The people put their trust in the Lord. Sometimes being still and letting God fight for us reveals to us 
a way to walk forward into our freedom that is terrifying and scary and requires bravery and trust. But when God sometimes calls me to freedom, to step into freedom, to experience all his fullness in a greater way, it's so scary that I look for me-sized solutions when really I'm called to God-sized trust. In that moment for the Hebrew people, they couldn't possibly have been imagining what God had planned in their salvation, how God was going to deliver them. They were looking for Misai's sort of solutions of maybe we can negotiate. Maybe if, if we're willing to surrender now, we can just go back to captivity. Maybe we could put up a little fight. Maybe we could just run. And God's like, no, 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 no Misai solutions. I want God-sized trust. Now, in the New Testament, there's this word for trust. It's pisteiu, and I don't really know how to say it. You can try your best. I think it's pisteiuo. Pisteiuo. Um, and it's a word that is oftentimes translated as salvation or freedom, or it's translated as faith and trust and belief. And in every sort of major popular verse that talks about salvation or freedom or relationship with God, it uses this word of faith, trust, and belief. Like Romans 10, 9, it says this, if you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and pisteiuo, in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. If you have trust, if you have faith, if you have belief, you will be saved. There's another one in Romans 1.16. It says, for I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who pisteiuo, first to the Jew, then to the Gentile, anyone who trusts and believes and has faith. And there are many, many more like this. But it reminds us that salvation and our freedom is not dependent on us doing the right thing. It's not dependent on us knowing the right answers. It's not dependent on us being perfect. Instead, it's dependent on us piste uo, believing, having faith, trusting, this radical trust where we are still and we let God fight for us. And then we have enough trust to walk forward into the very scary thing that he's leading us into. We be still. We can be still because Jesus has already fought, fought the battle and he's already won. We can have freedom because Jesus made it possible. We don't have to fear because God is fighting for us. We need only be still. Let him fight for us and follow into those places. Now, I don't know what army is pursuing you. I don't, I don't know what sort of thing that used to hold you captive is trying to go after you. But I do know that God is inviting you into freedom. He's inviting you to experience the fullness of freedom where all of the shame, all of the guilt, all of the addiction, all of the stuff that tries to ensnare you is gone. And he's inviting you into that. But the only way for freedom is to trust God and walk forward. So my question for you today is, will you? Will you trust? Will you be still and let God fight for you? Will you walk forward, though the water be on your right and your left? Will you trust to walk into that freedom? Now, the band's going to come up and, and we're going to worship together. But what I want to invite you to do is sort of a tangible response today. Is that during, during this time of worship, if there is something that you're like, yep, I need to be still and I need to let God fight this battle. I, I want to invite you to come forward to our station at the cross. And to take one of those post-its and just say, be still and trust that God will fight, and you can fill in the blank of whatever sort of battle it is, whatever army is pursuing you, that you would be still and trust that God would fight for you. Now, God is calling our names to step into freedom, to step into his kingdom, to step into greater freedom than anything we've ever known, and that is a scary thing. But we serve a God who is worthy of our trust, who has shown up again and again and again to free us and to free his people. So I want to invite you to step into that trust this morning. Let's pray.
Father God, I thank you so much that you are a God who shows up. That in those moments of fear, in those moments where whatever is holding us captive is chasing us down, that you show up and you say, no, 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 I got this. Be still. And so, Father, would you give us the courage and the bravery to be still and to trust you, that you can fight, that you are big enough for this battle, and that when you say walk forward, we would walk forward, that we would know that you are a God that is for us and not against us, that we would know that you are a God that is the champion of heaven, that there is nothing too big for you. Father, would you make us brave as we trust you and as we follow you? We pray all these things in your holy and precious name. Amen.